grateful to Dr. Malik and Dr. Schaefer for inviting me to come here. So I'll spend the next few minutes talking about minimally invasive total knee arthroplasty. Is it a fact or fiction? And uh, this is my uh, conflict of interest. Um, I guess the biggest disclosure is that I'm actually a joint surgeon. Unfortunately, I don't do any of the uh, joint preservation and exciting stuff that you do in your patient population. So the first thing is we have to define is what is minimally invasive surgery? Are we talking about smaller incision size or are we talking about alternative uh, uh, approaches to the knee joint? They're different, different uh, uh, terminology for different people and different uh, definitions. Um, I can tell you that what is not a minimally invasive surgery is this knee replacement uh, when uh, you open just about everything and the patient bleeds all over the place. Um, minimally invasive total knee arthroplasty, though, and you just heard Dr. Wolf talk about it, it, regardless of how you do it, total knee replacement, you're still doing the same procedure. You're going through the skin, you're going to have to cut uh, and arthrotomize. You're doing exactly the same bone cuts. And these bone cuts are really the same regardless of whether you do it through a 4-centimeter incision or a 15-centimeter incision. The nature of surgery still remains the same. You still have to dislocate. You still take the cruciates out. And uh, there's extensive stretching of the posterior capsule, et cetera. That's very different than what I call minimally invasive surgery today. And that is, this is how cholecystectomy used to be done, you know, through these subcostal uh, large, massive incisions, and now today they're done through this incision, and the patients go home the same day. So the nature of that surgery is very different than what we are doing today. We really haven't come very far, nor have we come compared to these people who are doing the abdominal uh, aneurysm through massive, uh, I remember that as a house officer in the English system, majority of these patients uh, were in the hospital for weeks, and uh, today you just do it through a little percutaneous incision in the groin, and you slip it in the vascular graft and the patient goes home the same day. So as orthopedic surgeons, I don't think we've really come that far, unfortunately. So regardless of how uh, we do the procedure and what we call it, it is really not very different to what it used to be done. But having said that, we have made some strides, and it's worth giving ourselves credit for some of these strides. So first of all, we've really developed a lot of great arthroscopic procedures, and that's thanks to uh, surgeons in this room. And uh, that has led to reduced cost and reduced hospitalization. The knee replacement surgeons don't stay in hospitals for 14 days or 21 days. And they, like the old days, they go home within two or three days. And some of this has been because of the media, some of it because of the patient-driven factors. Mm -hmm. And this has also allowed some of the surgeons to really use this as a marketing ploy or a marketing tool to gain access. And I come from Philadelphia, and I can tell you that I spend approximately 20 minutes each time when a patient is uh, uh, scheduling a total knee replacement, explaining to them the difference between gender knees and non-gender knees, and uh, sometimes that's pretty painful. So the concerns that people have with regard to MIS is that this is only cosmetic. There's really no, no proven benefit to MIS surgery at this point. This is, these are obviously the... Uh, uh, the anti-MIS campaign. There is a learning curve about how you do this procedure, and unfortunately the complication is higher in the earlier uh, days when you're doing this procedure, and perhaps there is risk if you don't use some guidance such as navigation, and then there's the issues with regard to patient expectations. One thing we do know is that the MIS surgery does take longer. It's longer per tourniquet time. It can lead to poor component placement because visualization is compromised, and hence that would be intuitive that your component position would not be as good. Early implant failures have been described. Periprosthetic fractures, more common wound healing problems, superficial infections, and so on. I can tell you one thing, and I agree with Dr. Wolf. The size of incision does not matter, and there's numerous studies showing that, and this recent one we did is of 50 patients in each group randomized completely it was a blinded evaluation, and there was really basically no difference in the uh, knee society score, functional outcome, patient satisfaction, opioid consumptions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't matter whether you do it through a six centimeters or you do it through a 12 centimeter the patient. It really, that's not MIS. So in my opinion, incision size is really not a definition of MIS. You, MIS has to mean something other than that. And there have been some systematic reviews here. The systematic review done by Kana showed that there was no difference between the two groups. This is MIS versus conventional with regard to long-term outcome, 
but the shorter outcome was better in the MIS group, which is understandable, and by short-term outcome, they meant straight leg raising, range of motion, and some of the functional parameters. In terms of their uh, hematological parameters, they lost less blood and they required less blood transfusion. Again, the MIS group did better. The 90-degree range of fle uh, flexion was sooner uh, achieved in the MIS group, and they did have recovery of their quads earlier, and this was particularly true if you were having bilateral total knee replacement. And the knee society scores were better at the earlier time point, but again, in the long term, there was no difference between the MIS and the conventional total, uh, total knee replacement group. So all in all, uh, it looks like the earlier uh, recovery is better. That's based on the systematic review, but there have been some others that have refuted those findings, including this one by the Lowry showed that there was no difference between MIS and conventional total knee replacement at the earlier time point. So how about other complications? Infection, not really very much different, uh, be it superficial or deep, certainly not statistically, statistically significant. In terms of revision, perhaps a slight tendency for the MIS group to require more revision than the standard. Again, that was not statistically significant in that particular, uh, in that particular review. Malposition of components was higher in the MIS group, especially in the various deformity uh, patient uh, population based on that systematic review. Uh, no difference in the uh, incidence of perineal nerve palsy, a slightly higher incidence of patellar tendon rupture, again, perhaps because of the poor visualization of these knees. Periprosthetic fracture, perhaps a slightly higher again, and you could argue that's possibly because of the component malpositioning. Interestingly, in the MIS group, much less incidence of uh, stiffness and need for manipulation under anesthesia, which is interesting and that could, uh, that could be uh, explained by uh, multiple factors. In terms of uh, blood flow during surgery, you know, we've all t heard people talk about patellar eversion is bad, keeping the knee in dislocation is not a great idea. This was one of the very interesting studies that came out looking at the blood flow to patella and it showed that the blood flow to patella is compromised during eversion and dislocation of the knee, and this perhaps could lead to less, uh, uh, less pain um, uh, generation of acute inflammatory nociceptors such as the nitrous oxide and all the others, that, uh, substance P, et cetera, that could lead and translate to a higher pain in patients who are undergoing standard versus uh, MIS surgery. So the review of that systematic uh, 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 meta-analysis showed that there was slightly higher complication with the MIS group. Some early uh, results with the MIS were more encouraging than the standard. There was no difference in the long-term outcome of these patients. And some of them argued that the benefits of MIS uh, was marginal at this point remains unproven. But there have been some strides uh, in, uh, uh, in introducing navigation systems that provides better accuracy, uh, perhaps uh, access to the knee in the future through arthroscopic approaches, tissue expenses, etc. And improved instrumentation will allow us to perform this truly in an MIS fashion. And it's interesting to see that uh, we've really made some strides in the uh, in the field of the implant design, but. The last few slides, I'll tell you that the MIS, there, you need to be aware of other complexities in this whole process. The tools we have for measuring outcome right now, in my opinion, is not very accurate. New Society score, for example, is not a sensitive tool for evaluating outcome in these patients. We need to design better tools to try to measure these. And what a patient describes as satisfaction is very different than surgeon satisfaction. And I think it's also very important for us to think about instruments that are really patient-driven and not surgeon-driven. Uh, in my opinion, MIS is not a procedure for patients with severe deformities, for elderly people, patients who've had previous open knee surgery, and hence they may have scarring tissues, patients with inflammatory arthropathy, et cetera. And considering that this is the type of patients I operate on a daily basis, and based on the Canadian registry, unfortunately, the majority of our patients are going to be at least on the overweight to obese. That's approximately 50% of the knee replacement patients in the United States alone are over the, oh, 50, uh, over, uh, in the overweight or obese. It's uh, arguable that MIS in this patient group will not work. The other thing to be aware of, it is great to be doing uh, outpatient surgery. And with all due respect for everyone who is trying to push for this, we need to be aware that this may not be for all comers. 
This is a study we did in which 2,000 patients who had arthroplasty, and we looked to see, this is a prospective study, we looked at the 90-day um, 90 90-day complication. 90% 90 of major complications happen within the first four days. So if I was the pe a person developing VTAC, I think I'd rather be at, at the hospital than be at, uh, be at home. And um, unfortunately, if we had let all of these patients who were undergoing total knee replacement go home on the day of their surgery, we would have had 6% of these patients could have had life-threatening complications. We would have lost 25 patients in that, uh, in that population. Although you might say, well, this is the high-risk group, so I will protect them. And it is true. It was, uh, these complications were more common in the older age group, higher BMI, higher uh, uh, comorbidities, and patients who had bilateral procedures. In about 35 to 36 percent of these patients, we could not pre, uh, uh, we could not uh, uh, predict that these patients would run into problem. So we need to be a little careful unless the nature of our procedure changes in the future. We need to be a little careful about how far we can push the envelope and need to add some sense to it. Thank you very much.